Welcome to the People's Forum. I'm your host, Kwame Ennis. Welcome back. Welcome back. We had uh, an exciting action information pack first half hour, so we had to extend it and do a second show. Um, once again, I'm here with Booker G's, author of Locked Up and Put Away, youth counselor for 10 years here in New York City. Now we're going to delve into the book. Booker, tell us about the book. Okay. As I said previously, the book starts out with me stuck in the middle of whether or not I was going to pursue my dream as a fashion designer or actually go into the profession of becoming a juvenile counselor. And then I start doing that. And um, at the time, I won't go through a training period where I'm actually um, being taught how to become a juvenile counselor <coughs> um, and what the population will be and the type of young people that I'll be dealing with. And then I kind of get overwhelmed by that experience because I didn't really come from a hood background, so I'm exposed to a different segment of the population that deals with things almost on an easy fix type of basis where they just take, take, take. Mm -hmm. And through that experience and be, being a father, I felt the need to share some of my own feelings and values and ideas on what it was going to take for these young people to change their lives. And I think in some ways I was able to make a difference, but because of the bureaucracy that goes on within the setting, there's a lot of things that I wasn't able to do in regards to getting closer to them because the administration that I work for, you know, they, they were kind of regulating how I interacted with these young people. Is it a cultural thing? Is it a money thing? What is it? Is it's a, it are it's we putting a, enough money into the system? It's, it's, a, it's a money thing. This is all about money. Who are not putting enough money in? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that it's all about making money. Making money, okay. okay. So it's all about these young people. I mean, technically for a young person to get locked up every day, the city makes $400 a day on that young person getting locked up. If that person's there for a year, that's over $150,000. That one child generates in, in the system. That's a lot of money. Okay. okay? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Sure. I hope you remember. Mm -hmm. You attended Delaware State as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. What did one year cost to go to Delaware State? Oh, my gosh. Um, I can't even remember. Um, back then, it was a lot cheaper, but it was... Uh, I mean, a semester may have been like ten grand or something. Ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So, mm -hmm. roughly, out-of-state student, twenty thousand dollars go to Delaware State. Right. If he if he were a state resident or in New York, like about ten thousand dollars or right. so. Right. So, we're telling you're telling me is they're willing to spend ten times as much mm -hmm. to incarcerate a child that's than a, to than to educate that's, a child. That, that, that's the reality of well, it. Well, the, the sad thing is those those numbers. Mm -hmm. um, according to my research, are systemic. In, in California, mm -hmm. you know, spending $45,000. Ohio, spending $39,000. Mm. Um, all of these different states right. spending money to incarcerate a kid, not, so not, it seems to me, not the same amount of money supporting the child Education. or the family, not whether it's to educate them, whether it's to educate mom, dad, mm -hmm. train mom and dad, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mom right. and dad can receive education in prison, mm -hmm. but not here in the free world. That's the sad part about it. And um, it, it, it was something that I made sure when I spoke to these young people, I told them, listen, you guys are prostituting yourself. You're allowing yourself to be used as a product, almost like it's like, uh, what is it? Um, when the cows come in, I mean, you know, like from the past, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like you know, you have uh, uh, livestock. I mm -hmm. mean, these these children are being used and made money off. They don't understand where they are in the pecking order in in, in this uh, worldwide system. Right. Um, they don't understand that America leads the world in incarceration its population mm -hmm. in adults and in children. We lead the world. Um, in the econ economic disparity, we right. lead the world in, in all of these things. Right. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't right. make a lot of sense. Right. Um, if, if I were to tell you that if a student is locked up, he gets free health care, free internet access, access to a weight room, cable television, uh, library services, sports programs, computer labs, laundry services, um, can actually earn a degree, whether it's a GED mm -hmm. or, or, or partial uh, college. Um, Three square meals a day, clothing, and free dental. Basically what it is. 
It's almost like sign me up. It's crazy. It's like we don't even get that living on a regular. If I'm a homeless basis. kid that lives in a homeless shelter, uh, you know, on St. Anne's Avenue, mm -hmm. is it almost better for me to be incarcerated than it is to be home? It, it, it's better in the sense that you know that you're going to have your own individual room, technically. So you're not going to be sharing that space with anybody. And then, like all the stuff that you mentioned too, you're provided all those services. So it's it's it's, it's a better it, it's a better thing for so, these young but people. But psychologically. Now. That's got to do a number on the kid. You're telling him to do these things and do the right thing so you can get away from here. But I don't have any of these things at home. And a lot of these kids actually feel this way and know this. Um, one of the things that disturbed me as well is how they would glorify the whole entire jail experience. I mean, they would much rather talk about how many cases they have, how many bodies they've taken, how many um, lives they've destroyed, as opposed to what they'd be able to do with, you know, educationally or academically, and that's not an issue for them. I don't want to uh, uh, be uh, negligent or remiss and not discuss the gang component to this thing because it's, it's a real huge, it's a huge thing huge. Um, all over our country. What You had a number of gang members, were they gang members uh, inside? I spent I spend about the majority of my chapters talking about gang activity because that was a big component in how um, we decided how to house these young people, mm -hmm. where we put them. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the agency felt it was safer to just house all these kids based on their gang affiliation. So all Crips in one dorm, that, all Bloods in one that's dorm, what would all happen. Latin Kings in another dorm, Nietas in another dorm. Or, or, or um, Patias in one dorm, or um, uh, uh, YBs in one dorm, all 1090s in one dorm, because, God forbid, you would put a Crip in a Blood hall, they would get jumped and assaulted. Immediately. So immediately. But what you would do is you would make these little packs that would kind of dictate how the hall would be run. So if they didn't particularly care for a staff member that was working there or any rules that were going on, they would just turn it up and flip the entire hall. They would break everything. And what's the youngest kid that you've ever seen come into a facility? Ten. Ten years old. Right. Was that for a major crime or was it for uh, some sort of school-related uh, pins petition. The kid basically threatened to bomb the school, and they locked so him up So it was a that. terroristic threat under right. our new guidelines. Right, and he was locked up for that. Ten years old? Ten. How long was he there? He wasn't there that long, but just the fact that he was there in that setting, it was sad because it's just like... He, he was, was supposed to be able to understand that he was making a terroristic threat? I, listen, I had no idea that I didn't even know that that could be considered something mm -hmm. that you would incarcerate a child for. Well, there are 33 states in the country mm -hmm. uh, where there's no minimum age mm -hmm. um, for a child to be incarcerated. Um, mm -hmm. One of the most famous cases, I believe, is from Florida, mm -hmm. where they actually uh, sentenced a 15-year-old to life. That's crazy. Wes, what did he you do? Know, he, he took the life of, of, a, of, a, of another uh, juvenile. Okay. Um, quote unquote playing, wrestling, mm -hmm. um, took the life of another child and, and actually ended up getting sentenced to life. And, you know, when these kids get in this environment, the kids with the least amount of uh, criminal background will be affiliated or around a kid that might be there for a double homicide. And, you mm -hmm. know, that ends up becoming something that he ends up so learning something from. So if I was a chronic from, runaway because mm -hmm. my mom was. Too. Um, a substance abuse uh, person. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad, you know, worked double shifts, and my home life was just intolerable. So I ran away mm -hmm. constantly. Um, of course, then being put on a pins petition, person mm -hmm. in need of supervision. Right. Um, once I violate that by not going to class or getting in trouble in school, mm -hmm. they quote unquote custodialize me and put me into a youth facility. Absolutely. So I sit next to the kid that's committed arson. Homicide, right, rape. right, right, and and those are the kids. I mean, it, it was weird because it was one time, and I describe it in the book that I'm actually playing the the game Uno with four kids, and one's there for rape, another kid's there for murder, another kid's there, and he's suffering from bipolar and ADHD, and I'm sitting with all of them, and it's like I'm looking at them, and I'm like, wow, it, it, this is just so sad that you know these young people are here mm -hmm. in this setting, and 
they're not really necessarily getting the right treatment to make them better. I mean, what I spoke about in the book is that what they probably need to do is come up with little, you know, probably like um, rehabilitation centers to help these young men based on what it was that they did to put them there and have them do that as opposed to locking them and having incarcerating them. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, in, in my experiences, alternatives to incarcerations uh, have been quite successful. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a former, a former uh, district attorney for the city of Boston, I believe, mm -hmm. um, and his name is Doss, okay. uh, Adam, Adam Voss, pardon me. Um, he, as an ADA, he took it upon himself to use his discretion um, instead of sentencing kids, whether it was drug sales, um, stealing cars, assaults, and instead of sentencing them to incarceration, he would sentence them to alternative programs, namely the group that he himself ran mm. um, as a one-on-one -on -one mentor. Mm. You know, so if you needed um, help educationally, he would get you into an education program. You know, he would make you, of course, accountable, mm -hmm. but he'd get you into that program. He just met the needs of the, of, of the student or the, the inmate mm -hmm. where the student or inmate was, as opposed okay. to saying, you know what, well, mandatory guidelines state that I have to do this to you. Right. Uh, you know, um, the fact that you couldn't make bail states that, well, you have to stay here until your family can come up with $3,000. How many mm -hmm. of those kids were there because their family just couldn't bond them out? 90% of them. 90% of them. Maybe even more. And I think based on what you were just talking about, um, after writing the book, I had an opportunity to be invited by the Manhattan Borough President to be a member of her task force. Uh, to reform Rikers Island. And what the goal is with that is to reduce the population from 9,000 to 5,000. And they're trying to find methods or, or ways to do that within a 10 year period. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so grateful that I was invited to be on this panel and in this, in this group because not only can I um, help them make uh, positive uh, decisions regarding Rikers Island, but I can also have that implemented with the juvenile justice system as well. Because they came up with something called supervised release where the uh, offenders can actually be released from prison you know after they've been arrested whether they have a, a misdemeanor or a felony mm -hmm. and they can be supervised outside of being locked up and I think that same thing needs to be implemented within the juvenile justice system mm -hmm. I, I mean for juveniles you can actually be in prison for things that are not a crime Definitely running so. away from home is not a crime it's not a crime mm -hmm. cutting class is not a crime <laughs> missing curfew if you're doing it nine or when the street lights uh, cut off and you don't get into a 12 those are not in the penal law right but I would but our kids uh, can be incarcerated for that right and that, and that's I mean, that's draconian it, it's, it's doesn't crazy. make any sense it makes no sense and sometimes some of them were so embarrassed about what it was that they were there for like you know one kid was there because he threw something at a principal you know and he wanted to fit in with a group of kids who had like a murder rap or something else. So he's sitting there lying about what he was there for just to fit in. I mean, it's, it, there's, there's so much bullying that goes on in this setting. There's so much peer pressure. And these kids just try to almost follow each other to no end. Is it safe to say, um, and I don't, I don't put words in your mouth, is there a racial component to it? Are most of these kids Spanish speaking and African American? Uh, I know this New York City is predominantly an African American Spanish speaking city, but right. how many, I mean, there are easily probably three or four million uh, ki kids, uh, uh, Caucasian kids here. Right. Are they in the facility as well? No, they, I mean, if they get locked up, they're released pretty fast. And that goes back to what I was talking about in regards to how much money uh, these kids are a part of in regards to who is helping them get out. I mean, it always helps if you have a paid lawyer to get you out of prison as opposed to an appointed lawyer who has a huge caseload and really doesn't have the time to really look. I mean, he's meeting you for the first time. You know, you have five minutes to see the judge and this guy is asking you what happened. You know, that's not really helping I mean, the situation. I, I, I've been in court and many times the defendant meets his court appointed attorney through 10 seconds after the first defendant has been walked into the back. How is that? How, how, how can you win a case or at least get proper representation in that type of situation? It's, just, it's impossible. And, and a lot of these kids, um, their backs are against the wall just because, you know, they're African-American or Hispanic. And normally, these are the ones that end up locked up all the time. I mean, I very rarely every now and then will see an Asian kid or I see a white kid that was locked up because usually they had a paid lawyer that would get them out immediately. So this this breaks down down it breaks down down economic lines. Always.
It always breaks down economic lines. And unfortunately, um, that's just the way it is here in New York City. All right. When we come back from this next break, we're going to get into some further chapters. We're going to talk about some other alternatives and some success stories um, mm -hmm. that Booker has seen. Mm -hmm. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. And even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. I have a mentor, and she convinced me to continue my education. No one receives a diploma alone. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, go get it. You can do it. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Mm. All right, Booker, you spent 10 years doing it. What are the answers? We have uh, our last segment to go. We need some answers. What do we do to solve this problem for our kids? It's, it's, it's to educate them. The important thing is that we need to find ways to get into the schools to talk about the issues that exist within this setting and to dispel the myth that you know, glorifying street violence, glorifying gang activity, glorifying being locked up is something that's a positive. And I think the beautiful part about it is writing the book has given me the opportunity to go into certain high schools, to um, speak to people like yourself about the issues because normally when, you, when it comes down to juvenile justice, it's very rarely a major topic because you're normally just talking about jail in general. But when you go to the whole issue of mass incarceration, it starts on the juvenile level. I mean, there is a child somewhere 11 that is borderline which direction he's going to take it. But that 11-year-old, the breakdown is at home. It the, is. The it, breakdown it, is with no mom doubt. and dad. It, 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 that's a fact, too. But then you he also... He was born into a bad situation. But you also have to keep into account that the city is responsible to provide services for these young people mm -hmm. to keep them from, you know, doing all these activities. I mean, what happened to, you know, the after-school program where the gym used to stay open at like 6 o'clock or 8? You know, when we were growing up, I mean, you know, you can go to your juvenile, I mean, your, uh, junior high school and it would be open until like 8 o'clock. You play ball or you can play ping pong. All those services are gone. And they don't even, I mean, I don't even know if many schools have art programs that, like they used to or music programs, you know, um, dance programs. Yeah, the, the humanities have definitely been cut back. Um, that, I, I would say more than half. Um, one thing, I mean, we both went to John F. Kennedy High School. Right. Um, we had a phenomenal uh, humanities program. Mr. Big time. Mr. Benjamin must have produced 10, 15 professional musicians you right. know we, we right. anything that you had an interest in you could you could actually do we right. had we had the photo club you know right. we have professional photographers and, um, and let me ask you this what's going on with our high school now um, our high school is now five, four high schools in one. <laughs> see, see, come on, man. <laughs> it's the That's, same building. Come it's four on, high man. schools it's in one, joke. but the spirit is the spirit is still there. Okay. Um, we we have some 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 teammates that are still hanging in there trying to work with kids. And that's good. Um, thing. right that's here good thing. in the Bronx, the Bronx Knights. Um, that's you a know, fact. that's a and if if you have young men or young mm -hmm. ladies that are in that age range and that need some daytime mentoring, coaching, support, that's mm -hmm. one that I, you know, hands down will, you know, will put no will put my hand on immediately. Right. Um, right. But but I mean, even our own personal experience growing up, that's gone, man. These kids don't have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. And they sit around, if they're not a part of uh, summer youth employment, they're sitting around waking up late, just hanging out. You know, um, social media doesn't help much because these kids get tired of just, you know, they feel like they've done a full day's work being on their phone. And I mean, that's just all stuff that's not helping develop them properly. Um, you work with the borough president. Um, you've been involved. Um, are we failing these kids? Are we shrugging our shoulders? It's a lot of shrugging shoulders, man. It's, it's a lot of just talk. And um, my, my, my efforts are going towards reforming the system to find ways to keep these young people from being a part of it. And it begins with educating them and explaining to them you know, what it is that goes on in this setting. And um, I intend this coming year to be speaking in several high schools, to be st speaking in several community programs, not just in New York City, but around the country about this issue, um, because it's something that affects our future mm -hmm. as people. I mean, you know, when our children aren't focused on doing the right things, then they become the negative statistic. And instead of filling 
colleges were filling jails. Hey, I, okay, very recently, mm -hmm. um, LeBron James, Michael Jordan, um, Drake, all of these, you know, Oprah, everybody's now starting schools. Um, it's beautiful, man. Everyone's starting schools, everyone's starting K through 12s, everyone's uh, trying to put a business model um, forth that's going to help these kids. Mm -hmm. But what about the home life? It doesn't matter what's going on in that building if I have a scary situation when I, when I go back home. Um, I, th that I can see only the, the LeBron James situation actually educates and counsels parents. Mm. Um, what's going on in, 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 in your mind that you know that's out there to make sure that their home life prevents them either from getting to jail or when they get out of jail, they have a place where they're incubated, where, where somebody can hold them close. There's really nothing out there right now. And I think it's important that we, um, we do focus on the home component and um, figure out ways to help these young parents for the first time become an important part of their children's lives. And, you know, make sure that these fathers are a part of their children's life because that's a big part about it that is, is affecting these young men is that they're raising each other as opposed to being raised by a man who's actually had personal experiences that he can share with young people. And that's something that I seem to find my ways in doing most of the time because I am a father. Mm -hmm. So to me, the most greatest gift that I've had in my life is fathering my children mm -hmm. and helping them develop to become adults. And that's something that's lost in, uh, throughout this country in homes. Uh, I mean, listen, I'm glad you said it because as a father to myself, um, it's the most wonderful gift that you can ever be Absolutely. given. Absolutely. Um, and not everybody feels that you way. You know, they come into the world and you watch the growth and development throughout their lives and you cry, you enjoy it, mm -hmm. you argue sometimes, you right. fight. But ultimately, you know, they succeed and you succeed. Right. I mean, you know, my son, he's 20. And he's going to be a, jo a junior at Binghamton. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing. My daughter's 14. You know, she's working some youth employment this summer. You know, she has money up for herself. You mm -hmm. know, my youngest son, you know, he plays Dykeman basketball in the, in, the, in the development league, just something that he likes to do. So these are like things. About, shout out to Mr. Couch. Oh, my. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt. No another doubt. Uh, Kennedy, another Columbia University, another okay. his father. City okay. uh, National Championship with CCNY okay. back in the 50s. So, okay. Um, Shout out to him. Yes. No definitely. doubt. No doubt. I, I got a question. Sure. Substance abuse. Mm -hmm. is, that a, is that a problem in those facilities? Um, we had issues with certain uh, young people that would get contraband transferred to them from visiting from the visiting area. So so it would be something Are we talking um, marijuana? We're talking, we're talking weed, we're talking pills, we're talking You um, mean like opiates? I mean, I, I don't know what's going on right now, but okay. I know it was something that was a beginning to become an issue at the time. But I know weed, marijuana is something that's prevalent okay. in this facility. And it was something that we would sometimes see or we would, you know, smell. And of course, the staff that's involved would get, you know, fired because they'd be responsible for that. But it, it was something that was happening. Is there um, treatment? I don't. I didn't see at the time while I was working there that there was treatment for for, for you talking about marijuana smoking. No, for well, for any substance abuse. Uh, do, do these kids come in? If a kid comes in at fourteen, and he's tested positive for marijuana and or opiates, mm -hmm. um, is he then put into a treatment program? When I was there, that wasn't something that was what was available. I think what it is is that when they're locked up because they're not in front of that possible, you know, um, drug that would lead them in that direction, that would be a, a, a part that would help them rehab from um, mm -hmm. being on something like that. I know in Long Island, that was one of the drug court was one of the alternatives to incarceration. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yeah, that, that was a big thing. Or, um, may, or, or maybe it's something that is implemented, you know, when they, when they get released, it's something that they have to do if a drug was an issue that was going on prior to them being locked mm -hmm. up, so. Um, how many of these, th these young men um, that didn't receive the support from home. Uh, is there some sort of uh, is there some sort of nest or some sort of coaching uh, triangle or something that helps inside those the kids facility? Out? Well, inside and out. Well, I know um, normally there'd be men that worked in this facility, like myself. <laughs> normally, fathers and the, the juvenile counselors that I work with 
was so hardworking and so dedicated to working towards changing, you know, um, the life of some of these young men. And mm -hmm. we would gravitate to them almost like big brothers. And, you know, what would happen is we would have a basketball team. You know, there was a situation where we would have rap, uh, a rap component, a, a poetry component, mm -hmm. where they would be able to exercise that part of who they were. Um, in the facility, they would have dance contests. They would have, um, they would, perform plays. Um, they would also uh, have like chess tournaments and they would have ping pong tournaments. Mm -hmm. um, they had a basketball team. Sometime we would play against the other facility. Um, so they were able to exercise any type of uh, um, dreams or hobbies that they had to um, develop them. And it wasn't just always being locked up okay. is what I'm saying. All right. So, All right. you know, th th those were the good parts about it. And I speak about it in the book right. as something that I found. A lot of these young people were extremely talented and had so much potential. But unfortunately, this was something that held them back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes they would just create more problems for themselves within the facility, you know, um, more incidents or, you know, gang assaults. And it would just keep them there longer. All right. Um, we've got 30 seconds before I jump off here, but I want to give you the last, well, second to the last word. Okay. Um, what do you want to say? Um, basically, uh, first of all, please read my book, Locked Up and Put Away. It's available on Amazon and on barnesandnoble.com and on my website, uh, lockedupandputaway.com. Um, the important thing is that if you have a young person that's in your life that might be borderline dealing with an incarceration situation or not, have them read my book, and I'm sure it'll give them a better insight in what's going on in that setting. Okay. Um, and my last and final closing words, um, once again, to a book. Um, when I was uh, working and working in the schools, um, Tukey Williams, uh, who is now deceased, right. had a book. It was called, uh, the name just escapes me, but he's, mm -hmm. it's a, he's a Crip gang right. member, mm -hmm. um, and he had a book riveting, riveting, very 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 visceral you could feel what was going on right and i would hand that book out mm -hmm. to my troubled kids gotcha. um and a lot and that's of them what I do now. came up to me years later and said you know what mr ennis um i'm glad you gave me that i'm glad mm. you really it it gave me some insight as to what really went on right and the, the last thing i want to say before we actually close is that we need alternatives to incarcerations we have to vote we have to make sure that our district attorneys do what we as a community want them to do. Mm -hmm. If we vote somebody in as a district attorney, make sure that, they're, that, that they are a component of alternatives to incarceration, to mandatory minimums, mm -hmm. and to bail reform. Thank you. This was an Thank exciting you. show. Without a doubt. Booker G's. My man. Nights forever, man. <laughs> Always, baby. All right.